Hi, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Crafting and Crime Daily, the show where I, Rebecca, aka Crafting Journey, recap live trials. And the trial that we are talking about today is the trial of Scott S. C. O. T. Peterson. He was a school resource officer at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School down in South Florida, Broward County, be to be specific. When on February 14th of 2018, Nicholas Cruz went into the building and murdered 17 people, 14 children, three adults, and injured 17 other people. But first, yes, I was, I haven't cleaned up from last night. I was, let me tell you, I was in a mood. So yeah, I watercolored last night. Here's some of the pictures. My friend sent me a picture of some stuff in her garden. Now these are, uh, what did she call these? Bubble flowers? Balloon. Balloon flowers. Super cool. Really a cool looking flower. This one was a brown eyed Susan's. And I added a little butterfly. Just, you know, why not? And this one, I think she said it was a pansy. I don't know. It looks like I, it looks like it's coming to get you with the two horns here. Yeah. Just uh, it's a miracle I got these out. Let me tell you in the mood that I was in. But I'm mean, calm down. I put the rent check in the mail. I do not plan to move. Yeah, I threatened the landlord yesterday. She's just being a pain in my ass, to put it frankly. You know, these landlords, they don't want to spend, they just want to put you into a house. They don't want to spend a dime on maintaining the property. God forbid. No, I. this is what she said to me years ago. She said, this home was built in 1952 and I'm not putting any money into it. Okay, you've made yourself clear. Because I told her the windows, they don't open properly. Like if, if this house caught on fire, I'd play hell to open some of these windows. Half the windows don't open and i've told her that she don't care so with the whole thing with the tree that fell on the house you know she decided she's just going to pay the guy to just do just remove the tree that's it that's it she's not going to trim any of the trees she doesn't care if they're about to fall over she said and i quote when they fall over i will make an insurance claim and then take care of it okay Hopefully they don't fall on me. <laughs> I know, and I probably overreacted, but you know, I asked her to call me. I was texting her and I asked her to call me to have a conversation. I said, can we please have a conversation? Because she usually just ignores my texts, which is what she was doing yesterday, ignoring my texts. So she calls me right back after I texted her that and she's yelling at me. I'm on the lawnmower. I'm like, I don't care what you're doing. I want to have a conversation about this house. A calm one. Oh no, she's screaming, screaming at me. Anyway, and that always sets me off, throws up my defenses. Then I had this, you know, I suffer from negative negativity, this anxiety and, and depression. And the first thing I go to is negativity, you know, and that's the place that I stay for a few hours. And I apologize for that. Anyway, if you tuned into the live yesterday and you saw me in a bad mood, it's because I was concentrating on these gorgeous flowers. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Back to the story that you came for. We're four minutes in. I've lost half my audience. It's okay. Yeah, that's the negativity talking again. All right. So yesterday, after the openings, which I covered yesterday morning in, in yesterday's episode, then we get a motion from the defense. Well, he, he this is a motion that the judge had reserved ruling on to the time of trial. So the, the defense attorney stands up and he says, I need a ruling on my motion. There's going to be some sensitive videos for the next couple of witnesses. And I think, you know, he made a 403 objection. Uh-oh, somebody's talking about me, right? Yeah. Anyway, 403 objection is is when they say that showing or the, the the evidence is more prejudicial than probative. In other words, and and I don't disagree as these videos. So the judge is like, oh, I got to hear the video, the videos. It was two uh, taken on cell phones. 
I got to hear the videos. So he plays them. Now we don't get to see the footage of what was being filmed, but we can hear it in the courtroom and it is horrendous. It's so prejudicial. I mean, if I was a juror and I knew very little bit about this case, as I suspect they do, and I had to listen to that, ah, uh, yeah. Well, the judge disagreed. He says, no, I think they are probative. And here's what, because the defense's argument was, these videos, these cell phone videos were taken on the first floor. My client wasn't even at the building or anywhere near the building, wasn't even aware of the shooting at the time these videos were taken. So they're not relevant. He's not charged with child neglect of anyone that suffered a loss on the first floor. He's charged with what happened on the third floor. So the, the argument that the prosecution made was that you can hear the gunfire when it moves to the third floor. You can hear it. And the jury should be able to judge it. The whole issue is what could this officer hear? So because there are third floor shots on this videotape, the judge says, nope, they're co it's coming in. I mean, I disagree. I think it was very, very prejudicial. And while the judge was listening to it outside the presence of the jury, he's listening to it to make his ruling. At least one or two of the parents that are in the pews gets up to leave. I mean, they're very upset by this. They have, they have to relive this over and over again. I don't know why the prosecution is even pursuing this man. It's ridiculous. I'm sorry. I got to give you my opinion. It's ridiculous that they are putting the family through this again. And the witnesses. So let me talk about the first witness. So the first witness is Danielle Gilbert. She, at the time, was a junior or a junior, I believe. And um, she was on the first floor. It was fourth period. She's in classroom 12, 13. And she said it's about 20 minutes before the bell was to ring. She said it was, you know, other than being Valentine's Day, it was, you know, a typical day. She said, but there was balloons, there was excitement, people were getting flowers and chocolate. And it was just, it was a fun day. So she said, all of a sudden they hear this loud piercing sound, the, the, the bullets. And so the, everybody gets up and scrambles and the teacher puts them because first they go to the windows and she's like, the teacher said, no, no, stay away from the windows. And there's very little places to get away from anything in these rooms. So they um, had like an L in the corner. So they're outside the presence of the door and they're all huddled. I mean, there's 30 people, so not everybody ended up in the corner, but they're all back there huddling against each other. And uh, she said, all of, you know, during this whole thing, Nicholas Cruz puts the gun through the window and starts shooting. And you hear screams, you hear after the shooting, you hear this guy moaning in pain, writhing in pain. You can just hear it. And he injured three children and killed one. Yeah. So sad. And she said the name, and I apologize, profusely apologize. I didn't get the name of the person that died in her classroom. So after the shots stopped, well, let me just tell you what I could hear on this video other than the guy moaning and writhing, you know, with respect to the gunshots, you can hear them fade away as he's moving away from the classroom and up the stairwell. Um, so there is a difference. And that's what this woman admitted to on cross-examination. She's, she's doing really well. She's went to college at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, and she's graduated. She has a degree in criminal justice. Uh, with a minor in psychology. wonder what she's going to do with that degree. Probably go to law school. So she's just about to move back to the community from Orlando since she has graduated. 
So she explained that while she was huddled down, she called, the first thing she did was call her mom because she wanted to hear her mom's voice and her mom wanted to hear her voice. Um, and then she decided to make these recordings. She actually made two recordings. And with respect to the number of shots, I, I didn't count, but at, at least 10, at least probably many more. And she didn't count either. She, she couldn't say for certainty how many were shot during this. Now, because this footage had already been played in front of the judge outside the presence of the jury, uh, it was replayed for the jury. Now, the judge, before he brought the jury in, warned the family members, I got to replay this. The jury has to hear it. So I don't want any disruptions. If you think you might react, you need to leave now. And um, <laughs> interestingly enough, one, one of the family members uh, put earplugs in his ears. <laughs> Bless his heart. Put, he had earplugs um, going. So on cross-examination, she agreed with the defense attorney that the sound did die down quite a bit as he approached the third floor, which is, you know, she's on the first floor. The sound is dying down as he's going to the third floor, which is when we know that this defendant, Scott Peterson, the SRO, is now in the vicinity and he is like the farthest away from it. Nicholas Cruz is at the farthest point away from the other side of this 76 yard building. Nicholas Cruz is on the third floor of the west side. The, stu the school resource officer arrives on the east side 76 yards away and he cannot determine where the gunshots are coming from and then he retreats to his position between the uh, the 700 building and the 800 building. Next witness is Ivy Seamus. She was a teacher. She appeared via Zoom. So there was a lot of breaks for the jury yesterday while they sorted out the technology because for some reason the defendant had to be on the Zoom, the judge had to be on the Zoom, and the prosecution had to be on the Zoom. So they had to make sure that there was a computer in front of the defendant and a computer, you know, it was logistically very weird. So, and the camera was allowed to show the zoom. So when you saw the zoom up in the screen, the jury could see that there was, you know, the, the teacher, she was a teacher, Ivy Seamus, the judge, the defendant and the prosecutor. It was strange. Anyway, so she had, been a teacher at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas for two decades. She started in 2001 and continued to 2019. And she is now office manager at a private school in Washington, D.C., which is why she was not available to appear in person. And that happens a lot now, especially nowadays with Zoom. If you're outside of 100 miles from where this trial is taking place, you're considered unavailable but you can make yourself available now by a Zoom. Once upon a time, <laughs> I practice law. If, if a person was in another state, good luck getting them down here. Good luck. You'd had to, you literally had to fly them, pay to fly them down here. Um, and yeah, it was interesting. Okay, so she was teaching social studies at the time. The history of the Holocaust, and more specifically on that day, she was teaching in room 1214. She was talking about the 1936 Olympics and Jesse Owens. I don't know what that had to do with the Holocaust, but okay. So they were discussing the Jesse Owens story when they heard a loud noise. So they all scrambled out of their seats and they were trying to find cover. So she said it sounded like multiple shots in the hallway. She said there was really nowhere we could hide. They were all huddled together. And then, of course, Nicholas, these doors have these glass windows. So Nicholas put the gun in and was shooting. He injured four students and killed Helena Ramsey and Nicholas Dorette. So once he was done shooting in that window, he went across the hall and to 2013, where we, he, we know he was shooting in that window. 
and she said the sound did die down when he walked away to the across the hall now through her uh, we got in another video that where you can again you can hear kids screaming you can hear the gunshots you can hear them fade away as he makes his way up the staircase and she said that the one of the students that she was huddled with named kelly um, had her cell phone and called 911 well as we learned through the opening statements those 911 calls were going to coral springs not to brown sheriff's office and she kept screaming into the phone 12 14 12 14 12 14 so you know where because they all claimed they didn't know where the gunman was for you know 30 minutes after this started they still don't know where the gunman is she had told 911 but it never got relayed to the brown sheriff's office so crazy so the next witness is Ron Lowther. He is the digital forensic video technician for Brown Sheriff's Office. And he did something so interesting. I wish we could have seen it. Like, I don't want to see, well, I don't know. Maybe I do want to see it. But what he did was he took the video, the surveillance. There was 50, 60 cameras around the campus. He took the surveillance video from the cameras that hang at angles of the shooting. And then he took surveillance video of the cameras that had the defendant on them. And he synced those two videos together. And he had already done that for the Nicholas Cruz trial. But then he added in the dispatch audio where he synchronized that to the two videos so that they were all three running in real time. So the jury got to see what, what was happening at any moment in time with Nicholas Cruz, with the defendant, and with calls that he was making over his radio. I just think that's really powerful, powerful testimony, and I wish I could have seen it. So some of the things you hear on the the video are because you could hear the audio you could hear the dispatch audio uh stay away from the 12 and 13 building they really did not know where between the 12 and 13 building these shots were coming from uh then there was a child uh injured with leg by the we're out by the football field and the defendant actually asked him does he know where the shooter is? Uh, so he, the, the, the child that was injured was able, because he was horrendously injured, like life-threatening injury to his leg. So he described that it was a, a white male in a hoodie with an AR-15 or an AK-47. Um, best he could do. So the next witness was Sergeant Heinrich with the Coral Springs Police Department. He is currently the sergeant of the canine unit but at the time um, of this actually I don't know what he was doing at the time of this incident but um, he he said that for four years of his career his lengthy career um, and I'm not being facetious there he he really has been a police officer for a very long time he said he was a student resource officer for Coral Springs High School so the prosecution asked him to describe what are some of your job duties as a student resource officer. So he was saying at the time that he was there, Coral Springs was, um, I need coffee. Coral Springs was inundated with gang warfare. So uh, he investigated a lot of crime, uh, intercept, <laughs> put, throw himself in the middle of a lot of fights. He would take care of bullying. Uh, he would investigate child abuse and he said he did a lot of mentoring but uh interesting job so this guy he just he did not need the prosecution to ask him questions he just like sh took off because he's so experienced on the stand he knew exactly how to tell his version of what occurred that day he happened to be on the property the school property because his son is at the time was a junior at this high school, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And 
he his son played baseball, so he volunteered to maintain the baseball field. So he said he would go out there every early afternoon, maybe a couple hours before the bell would ring, and he would water down the baseball field. And he explained why you do that. He would maintain the baseball field. So that's what he was doing that day. He was actually hosing down the baseball field, and he was standing between second and third base, hosing down this baseball field. When he heard the fire alarm go off, and he started seeing, and he says, I'm very familiar with fire alarms that go off, you know, at, in a high school. I know how kids respond. And he said they were walking normally. It seemed like a normal fire drill type thing. Then he heard what sounded like fireworks or firecrackers, and he started to see children running. So he said at this point, it occurred to him that this might be an active shooter situation. So he starts, and he didn't have a weapon on him. He starts heading towards the sound. He said, that is what you are trained to do in an active shooter situation is you, as a police officer, you go towards the sound. If you don't hear the sound, you know, then nobody's being shot. But if you hear the sound, someone is being shot. You need to move towards that sound. So he's running towards the school and he's continuing to hear what he thinks is gunfire. He knows that it's, he's very familiar with the school. His son goes there and he says he knows it's coming from between the 12 and 13 building. But he, uh, he walks over towards the parking lot, the senior parking lot, which is just above the, like building 12 is here, building 13 here, and the senior parking lot's here. The baseball field's way out here. So as he's, as he's progressing towards the parking lot, he runs into this child, Kyle, what was his name, Kyle? Maybe I didn't write his name down. Kyle Lamont. Yeah. So, and he's screaming, I, I need my mom, call my mom. And he was very, very injured. He said he was at, at, at risk for like bleeding out and dying. So because he didn't hear any more gunshots, he start, and he's, plus he's unarmed, he starts to take care of Kyle. And Kyle does tell him that he was shot on the third floor. So at this point now he's hearing, he hears more gunfire, but he still couldn't tell where the gunshots were, that he didn't know if they were inside the building or outside the building. And he could, he, he could ascertain only that it was somewhere around the 12 and 1300 building. Now, when he said that, that he couldn't tell if it was inside or outside, you could see the defendant going, shaking his head, nodding in agreement as, because this is what the defense is. I couldn't tell where this was coming from. I didn't know if it was in the building, out of the building. That's his defense. In fact, this police officer that was on the stand, he, as he's approaching that parking lot, he looks behind the exterior fence and sees a Brown Sheriff's deputy in position behind his vehicle he's not moving towards the shooter like you would do in an active shooting because he says i don't know where this gunfire is coming from so he was he just maintained that position behind his vehicle so after the gunshot cease he takes kyle um by then, there's been several radio transactions because he's run into a number of the SWAT team, too. And he takes Kyle into the baseball office where he knows there's first aid stuff, and he just tries to do whatever he can to stop the bleeding. He said EMS was there very quickly. And at that point, he, he meets up again with the head of the SWAT team, who he knows personally. The guy gives him a vest and a gun, and they are moving towards the building. 
Now, as they get towards the building, they realize that there's already two SWAT teams inside the 1200 building and that they're really not needed. So they kind of back away and he starts um, assisting kids as needed. Now, he didn't finish his testimony. That's going to continue this morning. And because I slept in late, I missed it. But I, I'll watch it on the replay of my life. I'll watch it on the replay. Yep. Interesting, interesting case. Because it's all about where, what could he hear? Like, you're trained to run towards the shooter. But you don't know where the shooter is. You're trained to run towards the gun, towards the sound. But he doesn't know where it is. So is, is the jury going to be critical that he retreated instead of moving towards the sound? My fear is that had he entered that building, like the football coach on the West End, had he entered that building on the East End, he'd be a dead man. Even though he was armed, I get it. I think he would have lost his life as well. And we would have had 18. But in any case, here's what I want to do with each one of these uh, um, episodes. I want to feature one of the victims. In this case, Nick, Nick Dorette, who was in Ivy Seamus' classroom, hearing all about the Jesse Owens story. Um, I'll put up an image of Nick. Nick was an accomplished swimmer, swimmer who had accepted an athletic scholarship to the University of Indianapolis when he planned, um, where he planned to study finance. His younger brother, Alex, was wounded in the shooting. Their parents started a charity called Swim for Nick, where they actually give out swimming scholarships now. And soon they're going to be offering water survival classes for toddlers. So something good came out of Nick's passing. So sad. So tomorrow I'll fit, feature another of the victims in this case. All right, guys, that's the episode for today. I'm going to clean all this up. I always have to wait for the paints to dry overnight before I put it away. Um, so I'm going to put this away, get my diamond painting back out. First, I have some errands to run. Yep. Yippers. All right. I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a great it's Thursday. Have a great Thursday. Bye, everybody.